Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Brian Baptist Church on this, this wonderful Sunday service right after Thanksgiving. So we are now in the holidays, okay? I have to ask this. How many of you did Black Friday? You did Black Friday shopping? Okay. Okay, right there. Okay. Uh, the husbands are so happy today. The wives did a, a sh really a short amount of Black Friday. You know why they didn't do Black Friday shopping? Because now every day is Black Friday. Black Friday started three weeks before Thanksgiving. It's kind of taken all of that out, but I'm glad you're here today. Certainly hope you're thankful, rejoicing in what the Lord has done, at least rejoicing on the meal you had on Thursday. And uh, we're so glad to have you here today. We're going to start by singing a song. Brother Jim Grew is going to be leading us here. All right, let's stand if you can. Number 243 in your hymn book, I Am Resolved. 243. On the first now, I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have a Lord my side. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to go to the Savior, leaving my sin and strife. One, he had words of life. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. The greatest highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to follow the Savior, faithful and true. What he saith, do what he willeth, he is the living way. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to enter the kingdom leaving the paths of sin friends may oppose me foes may beset me still i will enter in i will hasten to him hasten so glad and free jesus greatest highest I will come to thee. And wonderful singing and so glad that you're here. And I am resolved. That means you made a decision. Uh, you made a decision to come today. Somebody once said 80% of success is just showing up. Amen. So you're already 80% successful. And not only that, there's never a reason to feel bad about doing something good. You did something right today. And so that means another step is in the offering for you, and God can help us take that step. Let's have a word of prayer. Let's ask God's blessing on the service, because nothing can happen unless God blesses it and unless the Lord moves. So let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you, first of all, in thanksgiving. Thanksgiving about a church family. Thanksgiving about a church home thanksgiving about the gift of eternal life and that it is indeed a gift thanksgiving in that because you created us you have a special and specific purpose for each person here each purpose is not exactly the same but every purpose is for our good and our betterment so we pray, Lord, that you would help us to search for and find your will for our lives and the path that you have divinely placed us on. 
I pray that you would do a drawing work through the power of your Holy Spirit, each individual. If there be any individual and they do not know for sure that heaven is their home, that this would be a question that would be answered and settled today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may not be seated because we're going to sing a greeting song. Brother Amen. Jimmy. Number 520 in your hymn book. We'll sing it through. Oh, you know the thing. 520. I just keep trusting my Lord as I walk along. I just keep trusting my Lord and He gives us song. Though the storm clouds darken the sky or the heavenly trail, I just keep trusting my Lord. He will never fail. He's a faithful friend. Such a faithful friend. I can count on him to the very end. Though the storm clouds darken the sky over the heavenly trail, I just keep trusting my Lord. He will never fail. All right, let's greet one another. miss me? <laughs> Don't forget this. Uh, I, I put them out there. All right, folks, let's get back to our places as we sing the same verse, number 520. I just keep trusting my Lord. Ready? I just keep trusting my Lord as I walk along. I just keep trusting my Lord and He gives a song. Storm clouds darken the sky over the heavenly trail. I just keep trusting my Lord. He will never fail. He's a faithful friend. Such a faithful friend. I can count on him to the very Clouds darken the sky or the heavenly trail. I just keep trusting my Lord. 
He will never fail. All right, you may be seated, but hold on to your hymn book. 543. Five forty-three. I gave my life for Thee. Amen. I gave life for Thee, my precious blood. I shed that Thou might ransom be and quick and from the. singing is there anybody and you do not have the bulletin of the month bulletin of the month is the gold one art and Susie will get you one up here anybody else that uh, you did not get the bulletin we're just trying to keep everybody caught up on what is going on and of course we are now entering into the busy season of course I say that tongue-in-cheek if you've been here enough this year every season is the busy season now and uh, but we're heading into the holiday season and many, many special things that are happening, of course, coming to the end of this month and then in December as well. And uh, to parents and children alike, we are in we are full tilt now in rehearsal mode uh, for the children's Christmas program. And this is uh, more than a few songs. This is a drama and there's a play and there's parts and. And so anyway, uh, what you can do as much as you can bring your child to rehearsal will be very, very helpful. 
Uh, there'll probably be an extra Saturday rehearsal or two, and uh, we will keep you posted as to when those rehearsals are. But children, I am very, very appreciative of all your hard work of those, and then everybody who is kind of helping organize. This is very important. Understand, these, these are not light things because this play is about Jesus Christ. And a person needs to know Jesus Christ and receive Jesus Christ in order to go to heaven. That's what makes these things so very, very important. And of course, invite all your friends and neighbors, your in-laws and outlaws to, that'll be Sunday school hour, uh, December 18th. Uh, a few other things that are going on here and we'll keep you posted because we have other special events. We'll have Christmas caroling, we'll have a Christmas inspiration uh, once we launch into December. Uh, continue to be in prayer for Brother Glenn. Again, Brother Glenn is a deacon candidate, and we mentioned that last week. And again, uh, what you do is, Pastor, what is my part uh, as a member regarding a deacon candidate? And what you do is you, you read the Word of God. You read the Word of God, what it says about what the qualifications for a deacon and a deacon's wife are. You read that, and uh, then you make a decision. Of course, uh, the second Wednesday in December, there will be uh, a vote. There will be um, a closed ballot vote on, uh, on a deaconship, but it's an important step. And uh, Glenn and Sherry have prayed about it and said that they are willing uh, to assume that role. And so be in prayer for them. Remember that if you would. Also this, December's right around the corner. We do have only a half a dozen of these particular devotionals. Uh, this is Dwell Magazine, and that is in the turnstile that is in the foyer. Of course, the Baptist bread is November and the December. We have plenty of those as well. So want to let you know about those. And then also this, in the foyer, there's just a few of these cards. But what it is, is it's listen to Christmas music. Believe it or not, it's already started on knvbc.com. What is KNVBC? That is North Valley Baptist Church, Santa Clara, California. They have a wonderful, wonderful radio station online, and you can get the app. If you put in KNVBC, there's an app. You can put it on your, on your Android or smartphone, and we already have it on and several others in the congregation. But anyway, if you don't, there's those cards right there in the foyer and can pick up one and you can get online for that. It is easy to get bad music in your home. It is not as easy to get good music in your home. And so when you find it, hang on to it. And this is one that you can hang on to uh, right here. Uh, making mention of this again, um, normal schedule this week. Well, as normal as it can be. We have, um, you know, Subtle Care at 3.30, Faith Bible Institute again at 6.30, for those who are returning students, the time to register is past. But for those who are saying, are thinking for the first time, I'd like to be involved in Faith Bible Institute, you can register all the way up to the actual second week of class. And that means literally you can register all the way to late January. And so anyway, just want to give you that opportunity. It has been such a blessing. Uh, to so many that have been coming. Next Sunday morning is our final preacher of the month. And that, believe it or not, is Pastor Frank Umber from Somerville Baptist Church. And he's coming across the mountains, if he can get across the mountains. And, um, and he is going to be preaching for us. He'll be in the Sunday school hour and the Sunday morning service hour. We're so excited to have him coming next week. Uh, again, um, we have uh, men's, uh, men's prayer, 8.30, ladies' prayer, 9 o'clock, and all church soul winning on this coming Saturday. And so just kind of letting you know everything that is going on here. And at this time, uh, the men are going to come forward to receive our Sunday morning offering. And we do thank you for, thank uh, the Lord for Brother Bob Valier, who is here about a week ago, and he checks our books and and, um, and goes through things and gives suggestions. And, and uh, he said, gave us really some very good practical uh, suggestions that can help the reports actually be more readable than they are now. And I'm always happy when somebody has another idea that's going to help us out uh, because it is our desire to, for all of you to know as much uh, what is going on. And God has been so very good to our church and uh, to the membership uh, your generosity has been amazing. There's just no two ways about it. And God is using it for eternity. Uh, I was talking to uh, a, a few men. I was talking to Brother Jonathan Skeen again, 
in Ukraine, bombs falling all over the place. He said, Russia is losing the war. They're losing. Because they're losing, they're bombing the cities right now to try to break the will of the people. But uh, anyway, um, but uh, Brother Skeen, his ministry is flourishing and they're helping a lot of people in the new town that he set up shop for. And so we praise God for that. Understand that God is at work and you have a part in it. Every time you give to Faith Promise Missions, it's amazing uh, what God does through this little church. So thank you. I'm excited about it. You won't know till you get to heaven exactly uh, what your difference made, but I'll tell you, it's making a mighty eternal difference. Praise the Lord for that. So we're going to have a word of prayer, ask God's blessing on the offering right now. I'm going to ask Brother Carl Niederwerfer if he would bless the offering, please. Father in heaven, we truly are so thankful that you have uh, blessed. And uh, Father, we, we just ask that you would continue to do that. We ask special prayer for uh, both people in the Ukraine now, uh, many Christians there, Lord, and for Brother Skeen and all that he's doing. And Lord, that you would protect them through the winter. And uh, Father, that uh, you would bless uh, our church and, and continue to help us to, to give out of a heart of love cheerfully that we may see your work go forward and continue to uh, help people to come to the Lord. We love you, Lord. Thank you and ask your blessings on this uh, offering in Jesus' name. Amen. I was looking up there in the balcony, I'm going, wow, how beautiful does that look? One of the things that we're doing right now is we're repainting uh, a lot of our church interior, a unified color. And uh, I'll tell you that, uh, that bat, the, uh, the balcony looks wonderful. It, it, it was three or four colors. I'd look and there were three or four colors up there. It's now all one color. Looks fabulous. The foyer's been repainted. And uh, some of you have volunteered for other rooms. And there is a sign-up list if you just want to. We're doing this a piece at a time with the church membership. And I certainly appreciate it as we continue to work just to dress up the building. Just a reminder, choir rehearsal at 5 o'clock this afternoon. And again, uh, this is Christmas choir. We're working on a couple Christmas songs during the holidays. And uh, it's not too late to join. If you want to join the choir, uh, now's the time to do that. That'll be at 5 o'clock, and uh, we'd certainly love to have you on board. At this time, Brother Jim has one more song for us. All right, we're going to sing number 502. Let's all stand, if you can, please. And can it be? 502, all together. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood tied before me, caused his pain for me to him today? i 
Church, you are dismissed. singing and there is no way to underscore how amazing that love is we're going to turn in the word of God this morning to the book of Ruth chapter 2 we call it the Bible but I think it's important always to make mention as well it is the word of God it is God's declared word given to man Sometimes God is hard to know, but God wants you to know him, and the way to know God is through his word. We're going to be looking in Ruth chapter 2. While we're looking, let me make a couple comments. Uh, Mick, you are marvelously well-shaven today, just wonderfully well-shaven. And, I mean, you look sharp, you look dapper, and there's a story. So each one of you needs to come to him and say, why? There is a reason he can tell you that. And then, Abigail, we're continuing to pray for you. We're praying that Liam, Liam doesn't want to leave the motel room. And um, so we're praying for you on that and praying for an eviction notice. And, <laughs> and so we're just praying for, praying for you and Caleb as that time approaches. Ruth, the book of Ruth, chapter 2. We're going to be looking at quite a bit of this passage. This has an amazing thing to do not only with thanksgiving, but what comes after. Ruth chapter 2, looking in verse 2. Please look along with me as we read the word of God together. And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose side I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers and her hap. The word hap there means she just so happened. And her hap was to light on the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. And Elimelech was Naomi's husband who passed away in Moab, Naomi being a widow. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. Then said Boaz unto his servant that was set over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? When a man asks whose damsel this is, 
there's a reason. So you can think that through in your minds for just a moment. And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, It is the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from the morning now that she tarried a little in the house. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst, go unto the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. Now you go, Pastor, was this love at first sight? And maybe I'll give you the answer on Valentine's Day. This is not a Valentine's Day message. But um, I will tell you, you can ask Ruth and Boaz when you get to heaven. You ask them the whole story. Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why? It's an important question. Why have I found grace in thine eyes that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? And Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity, and art come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel under whose wings thou art come to trust. Then she said, Let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for that thou hast comforted me, and for that thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid, though I be not like unto one of thy handmaidens. And Boaz said unto her, At mealtime come thou hither, and eat of the bread, and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers, and she, he reached her parched corn, and she did eat, and was sufficed, and left. And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean among the sheaves, and reproach her not, and let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her, and leave them that she may glean them, and rebuke her not. So he glean, she gleaned in the field until even, and beat out that she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. It was not a small amount. And she took it up and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. And she brought forth and gave to her that she had reserved after she was sufficed. And her mother-in-law said unto her, Where hast thou gleaned today? And where wroughtest thou? Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee, and she showed her mother-in-law with whom she had wrought, and said, The man's name with whom I wrought today is Boaz. Let us have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would use your word to teach us both principles and a process today. Lord, the greatest tragedy for us on earth as believers is if we never move ahead. So I pray that you would use your word today to help us find a process from your word that will help us to take yet another step. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The message is a the message title is a question. Here is the question. What comes after Thanksgiving? Now, when I say that, there's certain things that come in your mind. Somebody might say Black Friday comes after Thanksgiving. 
And indeed, uh, my wife and I, traditionally, uh, we do a, a Black Friday sale. We, you know, rarely are getting things for ourselves. Usually we're getting decoration, Christmas decorations for the church. And other than a huge 60-pack of batteries, that's all we did. And uh, anyway, we have that. And some of you may say, well, the day after Thanksgiving is Black Friday. And others would say, no, it's not Black Friday anymore. They started Black Friday on November 1st or October 15th or something like that. And they call it Black Friday, and it means absolutely no nothing. A local store in town, they started Black Friday on Tuesday of last week. And they still called it Black Friday. And I said, well, I see you're open at 5 a.m. on Black Friday. Is there anything different from the sale book? They go, I don't know. I'm thinking, who in the world would come to your store at 5 a.m. if they can get it on Tuesday? So you have all those things. So when you have, what comes after Thanksgiving? Black Friday. Somebody else would say, may think of the main holidays. What comes after Thanksgiving? Well, Christmas comes after Thanksgiving. And so what is the pastor going to speak about? Is he going to speak about Black Friday? Is he going to speak about Christmas? And the answer is, neither one. Because when I talk about what comes after Thanksgiving, I go to have you flip the word around. I want to ask the question, what comes after giving thanks? I want you to think about this. What comes after giving thanks? In other words, we talk about having a thankful heart and a grateful heart, but is that the end of things? Is that the end of where God wants us to be or is he trying to gu guide us in a process, something after this? And the reality is he actually is. And it can change your life. And it can change my life. And so I want to give three points this morning dealing with what comes after Thanksgiving. In order to understand what comes after, you have to understand what comes before. So let me give you three points. Point number one is this. Faith comes before Thanksgiving. Faith comes before Thanksgiving. And I want to point out this man, Boaz, a real man. By the way, when we get to the end of things, you will discover Boaz is actually the great-grandfather of King David is who he is. And there's a story to that. It's an amazing what God put together here. But it's important to understand that faith comes before Thanksgiving and it's shown in the Word of God right here. Look with me at verse 8. And as you do, I want you to realize Boaz is what we call a type of Christ. And what we mean by a type of Christ is we mean an illustration, a symbol, there is a characteristic in Boaz that is supposed to point us to a characteristic that exists in Christ himself regarding you and me. Look at verse 8 here where the Bible says this. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter, go not to glean in another field. Neither go from hence, but abide here fast from my maidens. And I want us to realize this. True kindness is a rare thing, but especially when it is indiscriminate. When kindness shows up and kindness is general instead of being selective, instead of being specific. It'd be like me saying, say I come in a typical Sunday morning service and I show kindness to Sharon but I show no kindness to Shannon. That would be being discriminate. But true kindness is indiscriminate, and that is where it doesn't matter who it is, there's going to be indiscriminate kindness. And this was a characteristic of Boaz, and this is a characteristic of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is indiscriminate. And you have here, and he says, don't go and glean in another field. And think about salvation here. Once you found the truth of God, once you found the gift of God, once you found the salvation of God, you do not need to go glean in another field. You found it. Jesus said, ye shall find the truth, 
and the truth shall make you free. If the Son therefore hath made you free, ye shall be free indeed. There's no reason to go glean in another field. There's no reason to find salvation through Jesus Christ and go, okay, I think I'll go somewhere else now. And Boaz is saying to Ruth, you found it. Don't go anywhere else. This is the place. I'm going to be kind to you right here. True kindness is a rare thing, especially when it is indiscriminate. But then I want you to think about this. No when, no one when confronted with their own shortcomings feels worthy of grace. And Ruth in no way, shape, or form felt even the smallest bit worthy of Boaz's kindness. She was not a Jew. She was not an Israelite. She didn't have the right country. She didn't have the right upbringing. Her family did not have the right belief system. Why would this man show indiscriminate kindness to her? And in verse 10, Ruth said she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said, Why? Why have I found grace in thine eyes? That thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger. I'm not a citizen. I'm a nobody. From a country of nobodies. And I can't see why there'd be anything in me that would make you care about me. And there are people who feel that way all over the place, maybe even some here, and you go, why would God care about me? Why would he care? Why would he take notice of me? And the amazing thing is with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and of course Boaz being that type of Christ, Jesus wasn't looking for perfect people. Jesus was not even looking for righteous people. Jesus was not looking for chosen people. Jesus was looking to choose some people. And the Bible says this, he says, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And I'm here to tell you that God is a God of indiscriminate kindness toward you. Not because there's any one of us in this room that deserve anything from Almighty God. But there is a God who loves you. And there is a God who loves those around you. And there is a God who is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And that is Jesus. And when he died on the cross, he died for everybody. Not everybody will choose him, but he did die for everybody. I, I was taken aback. Uh, uh, Brother Carl and I were reading a section of scripture and looking at Judas and, and looking at the terrible decisions Judas made. And yet Jesus did die for Judas. Do you realize in the Garden of Gethsemane, the very first words out of Jesus' mouth when Judas portrayed him was the word friend? What an amazing thing. Understand, faith comes before thanksgiving. And here's where the faith comes in. Who we trust makes all the difference. Look at verse 12. And this is, this is Boaz talking to Ruth. He says, the Lord recompense thy work and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel under whose wings thou art come to trust. And remember, Ruth left everything and Ruth left everyone and Ruth left the false gods that could not see and could not hear and Ruth left the false system that could not result in blessing and could not result in joy and could not result in any kind of reward. And she made a decision with her mother-in-law, I am going to trust in the Lord God. And Boaz says, there's going to be a full reward for you because of who you've trusted. Understand, faith comes before thanksgiving and who we trust in makes all the difference. And people trust in so many things that can happen. Uh, listen, if you watch on the news and it says, trust the experts, don't trust them. 
And you can trust so many things in this world. In fact, the world clamors for you to trust so many things. You know, to trust, uh, to trust the medical field, to trust the financial field, to trust the credit card company, to trust this, to trust that, to trust biofeedback, uh, to trust uh, mankind. And you know, it's just not worth it. It does, it makes, who we trust makes all the difference. But if you trust the right person, Thanksgiving is just around the corner. There's something to be thankful about. There's someone to be thankful to. And I want you to notice this. God does not bless by accident. God blesses on purpose. Look at verse 15 again. And it says, and When she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves and reproach her not, and let also some of the handfuls of, let fall some of the handfuls of purpose for her and leave them that she may glean them. And this is what God is, God doesn't bless you by accident, God blesses you on purpose. And God has all these, the Bible says, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for those who love him. It says, you have no idea what God's prepared for. But I can tell you, when you're blessed, God doesn't do it by accident. God does it on purpose. He looks at you personally, and he blesses you personally on purpose. And this is what happened to Ruth. And this was the experience of Ruth. And you know, I wonder if Ruth picked up on it. I wonder if Ruth saw the guy in front of her and he had a handful, and he went, I wonder if Ruth saw that. And went, I don't know what's going on here, but things are getting a little bit heavy for me right now. I'm getting a little bit heavily blessed. And the reality is, God doesn't bless by accident. And what Thanksgiving is, is an extension of our trust in Almighty God. Verse 19, And her mother-in-law said, Where hast thou gleaned today? And where hast thou, where wroughtest thou? Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee. And why in the world did Naomi say that? Because Naomi knew what a good day's work was, gleaning in the field. And she went, That looks like about three days' work. What is going on here? She knew something was happening. And thanksgiving is an extension of that trust. I think of a man, he was a leper that was healed by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, and one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet. Does that sound familiar? What did Ruth do? Fell down on her face at Boaz's feet. Why? She is being blessed. And she went, why am I being blessed? And it was a sign of thanksgiving. And he gave him thanks. He was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, we're not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God. Save this stranger. And then God draws the connection between being thankful and having faith. And he said unto him, arise, go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. He didn't say thy good words. He didn't say thy thanksgiving hath made me whole. Thy faith hath made me whole because it's our faith in the good God of the universe that makes us thankful to the good God of universe where there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Every good gift is from above. Faith comes before thanksgiving, okay? But that only gets us to thanksgiving. We still haven't answered the question. What comes after thanksgiving? Here's one of the things that comes. Second point. It is the nature of the thankful to reciprocate. Do you understand? It is the nature of the thankful to reciprocate. And what that means is this. If somebody does something nice to you or for you, inside you, it, you develop a desire, well, 
I want to do something nice back for them. That's just the nature of Thanksgiving. It's not rub-a-dub-dub, thanks for the grub. It's not that. There's a nature, this person, these people, somebody did something nice for me. What can I do now? What can I do that's nice back? And that is just a normal nature to want to do that. It was normal inside of Ruth. Ruth went, I want to reciprocate. Look at verse 13. Then she said, let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for that thou hast comforted me and for that thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid, though I be not like one to thine handmaids. And what he's saying to Boaz, he says, you have been so nice to me, let me do what I can to be a blessing to you and to be nice to you. And, you know, it doesn't say that she could do anything, but she had the desire to do something to be nice back, whatever it could be. Boaz, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. You're so nice to me. Whatever you can find for me to do, I'll do it. it was, she had this desire to reciprocate. It is a normal part of the person of faith who realizes the good God that we serve and we thank the God that we serve and we want to do something for him. No, can we ever pay him back? No. Could Ruth ever pay Boaz back? No, but it's reciprocation. It's that natural response that takes us one step past just being thankful. We want to do something for the person who is nice for us. We want to do something for the God of the universe. We want to make a difference. We want to sing praise. We want to serve him in some capacity. We want to tell others, but we want to do something. It's just, it comes out of us. It's reciprocation, and that is a normal thing. There's a desire to look and act favorably, and that is what happened to Ruth here. And there's also a desire to stick around and to stay to the end of harvest. Think about that for a moment. Look at verse 21. It says, And Ruth the Moabite has said, He said unto me also, Thou shalt keep fast by my young ma men until they have ended all my harvest. And when you have faith that he's a good God, and when you have faith that he's blessed you, and you have a desire to reciprocate, why would you ever want to leave the field? Why would you ever want to leave the harvest? You want to stick around to the end of harvest. You want to stick around to the end of the season. What did Jesus say? The fields are white already unto harvest. It's harvest time right now. Why wouldn't you want to stick around with the good God and the God who takes care of you and you want to reciprocate and you want to help Him and you want to thank Him? Why not stick around to the end of harvest? Well, Pastor, why do some people not stick around to the end of harvest? Because they forget why they're thankful. And they forget about the good God. Understand, we cannot earn our salvation, so don't ever live a day of your life as if you did. Because the day you do is the day you'll become unthankful. And the reality is, he is still the good God. There's a desire to stay at the end of harvest. And then there's also this. There, there's loyalty. There's loyalty. Let me give you an example. Brother Jim, you had triple bypass surgery five years ago. Let me ask you a question. Six years ago. Would you ever recommend that surgeon to anybody? Oh, yeah. See? Oh, yeah. Well, what is that? That's loyalty. And you see, there's a nature of loyalty that takes place when somebody has done something to help you or has been very, very kind to you. That comes out, and that's part of this reciprocation. There's loyalty. Look at verse 22. And Naomi said unto Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that thou go out with his maidens, and that they meet thee not in any other field. It says, Ruth, I'm sure glad you found the right church. There's really no need to go into another field right now. So she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean until the end of barley harvest and wheat harvest. There's loyalty. 
Let me give you an example. There was a, there was, um, <clears throat> Jesus came into the house of a scribe or a Pharisee who was a little bit less thankful than the lady who also came in the door. Looking in Luke 7, verse 36, it says, And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet, and behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. How many of you go, okay, it's the middle of Thanksgiving dinner. Somebody's invited you to Thanksgiving. And all of a sudden, there's not even a ring at the door. Somebody just opens the door and barges into your house and begins doing nice things for your house guest. So... Now, I usually have a recommendation. If you don't want anybody to come in your door during the Thanksgiving meal, lock the door. You may want to do that. You're never sure who's going to come in the door. You don't have any idea. But it says this, And stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment, now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it and spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. And so we continue on. There's a certain creditor which had two debtors one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, frankly, he forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him the most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou is rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thy house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and have wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loveth much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. Verse 50, And he said to the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee, go in peace. And this is the thing, let me ask you a question. Because it will directly tie into your thanksgiving. And it will directly tie into your reciprocation. In your mind. And in your heart. Do you believe God has forgiven you little? Or do you believe that God has forgiven you much? Point number three. The product of thanksgiving is not service, but relationship. And let's look in the book of Ruth to see what is happening here. Because I want you to understand what has happened here. And that is... <clears throat> Ruth has become thankful. Ruth has trusted in Boaz and has stayed in his field. Ruth wants to reciprocate and serve Boaz. But the ultimate goal isn't the thanksgiving and it isn't the reciprocation and it isn't the service. The goal is a relationship. That is the goal. Look at Ruth chapter 3 verse 1. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, My daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? In other words, Naomi is saying, Ruth, things may be going well for you, but you haven't reached the goalpost yet. And now is not Boaz our kindred with whose maidens thou wast? Behold, he winneth barley tonight in the threshing floor. 
Wash thyself therefore and anoint thee and put thy raiment upon thee and get thee down to the floor. He's saying, Ruth, it's time to gussy up. But make not thyself known unto the man until he shall have done eating and drinking. And it shall be when he lieth down, thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie. And thou shalt go in and uncover his feet and lay thee down. And he will tell thee what thou shalt do. And she said unto her, All that thou sayest unto me, I will do. The product of thanksgiving is not service, but it's a relationship. And the goal is a lifelong relationship. Ruth is not looking here to make Boaz happy. Ruth right here is looking to make Boaz married. There's a difference. She's not looking for a little time of thanksgiving. She is looking for a vital, vibrant, and long-lasting relationship. And this is what's supposed to come after thanksgiving. This is what's supposed to come after faith in the good God. This is what's supposed to come after the reciprocation of faith in the God who treats us so well. And that is the desire not just to serve Him. And yes, we do. But it's to have a lifelong relationship, a meaningful and vibrant relationship with it. Look at verse 10. And here's what happened. And let me kind of summarize the story. Let's just say things worked out well. And she went to the floor and uncovered his feet so that his feet got cold in the middle of the night, scared him half to death, and he sat up and there was somebody there who said, who are you? Says, I'm Ruth. And you know, it's kind of interesting. She really did propose to him when you think about it. And Ruth is basic. She didn't say it in so many words, but she's saying, Boaz, will you marry me? Here's Boaz's response, and he said, Blessed be thou of the Lord my daughter, for thou hast shown more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. You see, we honor God when we put beside worldly interests. He says, Ruth, you could have chosen anything else, and you could have chosen something else but you chose me. And what God is hoping for with his children is children that will put aside the other worldly things, the things that distract and the things that dissuade and the things that get in the way and the things that make life unprofitable and say, I'm looking for somebody who will choose me, not just in service, but in a real, in vibrant relationship. I think it's important to understand and that is this. Christ did not rest until we were redeemed. Look at verse 18 of Ruth chapter 3. Then said she, this is Naomi, saying, Sit still, my daughter, until thou know how the matter will fall, for the man will not be in rest until he have finished the thing this day. And that man went to work, plowing the field, clearing the way, to make sure that there was nothing between him and matrimony with the woman that he loved. He cleared the way. He pushed aside every obstacle. And I want you to understand, Jesus did not rest when Jesus came to this earth. Jesus did not rest until we were redeemed. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12, it says, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever sat down on the right hand of God. He didn't sat, sit down before that happened. He didn't sit down until the job was done and the work was accomplished for you and for me to make sure that nothing would stand between you and a vibrant and forever relationship with him. That is what God has done. That is what Jesus did. He did not rest until we were redeemed. Boaz is called the kinsman redeemer because he had to redeem Ruth, who was a widow, when there's a lot of Jewish tradition on that. But Jesus redeemed you and me. And he did not rest until he had done the work. Well, now you're redeemed. Well, so now we're God's servants. 
That's not the word Jesus uses for his children. In John chapter 15, looking at verse 15, here's the word Jesus uses for you. Henceforth, it means from this time forward, I call you not servants. For the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Jesus does not call the redeemed servants. Jesus calls you and I who are redeemed. He calls us friends. Because a friend entails a relationship. And you see, the service for God is just an outflow of the friendship. Jesus said in verse 14 of John 15, You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. So we know faith comes before thanksgiving. And we know it's the nature of the thankful to reciprocate. And we know the product of thanksgiving is not service, but it's a relationship. So, what comes after thanksgiving for you? Do you have the gratitude that results in reciprocation? And when it comes to this relationship, do you have a deepening relationship with Jesus Christ? What comes after Thanksgiving? What should come after Thanksgiving for you? Let us have a word of prayer. I have a word of prayer and extend an invitation. As we pray, I want to say this. Friendship is a very interesting thing. Those of us here in this room, we choose our friends. Would you choose Jesus to be your friend? Understanding all the things that are involved in friendship in all the things that are involved in a relationship. Now, of course, everything starts with faith. And if you've never come to a point where you've trusted Christ as your personal Savior for eternal salvation, you know, maybe by no fault of your own up to this point, you're on the outside looking in. But God wants you in his field. He is a good and loving and faithful God. And he sent his son, Jesus Christ, who would not stop until he endured the cross and died for your sins and my sins that you could be redeemed. Being redeemed for a relationship, a close walk with him. Dear Heavenly Father, please use your time right now Help us to be drawn nearer to you. Help us to take a step that we could accomplish that which comes after Thanksgiving. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And as we stand, the song is number 223. 223. It's a song. It's a song where we ask God. We say, God, draw me near to you. And if you have a need this morning, the altar is open. For a few moments, I'll stand in the aisle. Perhaps you don't know if you're saved and you want to take care of that or there's another need. You come while we sing this song. 223. Let's sing. You come. I am thine, O Lord. I have heard thy voice and it told thy love to but I long to rise in the arm of faith, be closer drawn to Thee, be nearer, nearer, bless.
blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Drawing nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. With heads bowed, eyes closed, people praying, what is the need of your life right now? There is a good God who loves you and who wants you to take another step. Maybe you feel close to him. He wants you to feel closer to him. He wants to help you. He wants you to live a life of gratitude. He wants you to see his goodness. He wants you to make a difference in his harvest field, and certainly you can. But not as his servant, but as his friend. Will you join the harvest together with him? Let's sing that next verse. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope. My will be lost in thine. Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Oh, the pure delight of a single hour that before thy throne I spend. When I kneel in prayer and with thee, my God, I commune as friend with friend. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. There are depths of love that I cannot know till I cross the narrow sea. There are heights of joy that I may not reach. I rest in peace with thee. Blessed Lord, to the cross where Thou hast died. Nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to Thy precious bleeding side. You may be seated. Amen, you may be seated. Wow, look, our balcony is full. They brought Junior Church up there. Hope nobody gets a nosebleed in that high altitude there. So let me first of all talk about baptism. Baptism is a step. And a, a few Sundays ago I preached a message on steps. And baptism is a step. It is a step of a person that they take after they've received Christ as our per, their personal Savior. We do not believe that baptism saves. Baptism is an outward expression of an inward decision. And everything is done in a specific order according to the word of God. Baptism is an ordinance of God. It's something that every born-again believer should do after they've received Christ as eternal salvation. So I'm going to have our, um, this young lady come, and then I'm going to explain a few things here. Kendra, if you come down here. 
Put him, put him. And go ahead and stand right there. Go ahead and stand right over here. Right here. Okay, this is Kendra. And some of you may go, now wait a minute, I've seen her before. So let me explain a couple things. And, and I'm very, very grateful for this young lady because a little while ago, God began to stir in her heart. And, and I want to tell you something. People have, make good decisions and people have good intentions. But sometimes what will happen is a, a decision will be made and maybe there, there's not an understanding there. Uh, not through anybody's ineptness or incompetence, it just happens sometimes. And there, there came a point recently in Kendra's life where she really, really began to wrestle with this thing and going, am I really saved? Was there a difference? Was there a change? And she came to a decision a few weeks ago that that has not happened for me. That has not happened in my life. And so a few weeks ago, she prayed and received Christ as her personal Savior. And Kendra, just by what I think you've said to me, the lights came on yes. in a big way. And um, all of a sudden, remember I say there's a before and an after. There's a one, one, the Holy Spirit is working on you. On the other, the Holy Spirit's working in you. Amen. On one, the Word of God doesn't, it, it's there, but, it's, but it doesn't make sense. And all of a sudden, it's jumping out of the page at you. And this is what happened to Kendra. And so Kendra came to me and said, Pastor, we've got to do these steps right. And so she says, I need to get baptized. And so this is why Kendra is here uh, today. And so I'm presenting our, our sister in Jesus Christ that she has prayed and trusted Christ as her personal Savior for eternal salvation. And Kendra, when did you pray? November 7th. It's November 7th of this month. And so you know your sins are forgiven and you're on your way to heaven? Yes. And you want to follow the Lord in believer's baptism? Yes, I do. Spread this arm. Just bend your legs slightly as we go back. By this, our sister's profession of faith, Kendra, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Going back. Buried in the likeness of his death. Raised in the likeness of his resurrection. All God's people said, Amen. Thank you. Okay, at this point, we are going to close in a word of prayer. And uh, Mick, I'm going to have you close the service, if you would, please. He's, he's coming up. He's, such a, he's got such a gentle radio voice. You wouldn't hear him from the back. And so anyway, choir rehearsal at 5 o'clock. Service at 6. The only thing I'll tell you about the message is it's wanted, dead, and alive. That's it. Amen. Let us close in prayer. Father, I'm grateful and thankful that you brought us here today in the house that you provide for us to come before you to love you, to worship you, to sing to you. God, give you praises and thanksgiving. We thank you for this new baptism, new uh, life, and new name that's been written down in heaven. Lord, we're grateful, grateful people. Now keep us, protect us, guide us this day. Bring us back this evening. In Jesus' name, amen.